This is Taiwan Insider, a weekly news roundup brought to you by Radio Taiwan International. Every week, we give you an inside look at the biggest and most interesting stories coming out of Taiwan. I am Natalie So. And I'm Andrew Ryan. And here's your week in a minute. Tens of thousands rallied in Taipei Saturday in support of Kaohsiung Mayor Han Guoyu. Han is seen as a likely frontrunner in next year's presidential election, though he has yet to declare a run. On Saturday, too, he left his intentions unclear, saying only that he is willing to take on, quote, any important position. President Tsai says that Taiwan hopes China can move toward democracy. She was speaking Monday while meeting with a delegation of democracy activists in Taiwan on the eve of the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Tsai also noted that this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Kaohsiung incident, a major event on Taiwan's own road to democracy. The DPP has announced a new format for its upcoming presidential primary. Presidential hopeful William Lai has criticized the change, saying the party should have stuck with established procedures. Taipei Mayor Ko Wenje has marked Edel Fitter, attending a celebration held by Indonesia's representative office. Ko says Taipei will work to increase the number of medical facilities with an Islamic certification. The Dragon Boat Festival is here. Rice dumplings called zongzi are the traditional food of the holiday. Visitors to Taipei's Southgate Market can sample 100 unconventional varieties. And that's your Week in a Minute. Every week at the top of our show, we each come up with a word of the week to describe what's going on in our show this week. So, Andrew, are you ready to guess my word? I am. Okay. What do you have? Uh, a. Andrew? Not for Andrew. No. <laughs> are you happy? Art. Art! art. <laughs> yes. We're going to be talking about the art of dragon boat making. Also, we'll be looking at some award-winning iPhone photos taken by an amateur photographer here in Taiwan. And we'll be looking at responses to an art installation, the Tank Man exhibit that was erected in Taipei to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen incident. Wow, that's a great word, Natalie. You tied Thanks. everything together with us. Um, I, however, <laughs> am almost embarrassed to show you my word this week because I have exactly one thing on my mind. Andrew? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Just a hint, it's also a Madonna song. Holy? No. Holiness? No. Holiday! <laughs> Sorry, when it comes to holiday times, I can't think about much else. Oh, that's right. You know, it's we a have holiday. a Most lot of heavy news here in Taiwan, so it's always nice to kind of relax your brain a little bit. Everybody deserves a holiday. All right. Happy okay. Dragon Boat Festival in that's advance. Right. All right. So uh, we also have one more thing we want to show you, and it's a photo. Let's take a look at this. As you can see, this is a bird's eye view of a building that's located in the middle of a running track. So what kind of a building do you think that is? We'll have the answer for you at the end of today's show in our parting shot. Today we're going to look at the smartphone market. The United States has put top Chinese smartphone maker Huawei on a blacklist due to data security concerns. This could be the beginning of a new tech called war. Google has blocked Huawei's access to future Android updates. UK chip designer Arm and other companies have also stopped doing business with Huawei. But the U.S. issued a 90-day temporary license for Huawei to work with U.S. companies up until August 19th. So some say that Huawei is the United States bargaining chip in the U.S.-China trade war. Now in Taiwan, TSMC says its shipments to Huawei won't be affected by the U.S. restrictions. But Zhonghua Telecom and Taiwan Mobile have decided to stop selling Huawei phones once supplies run out. Yes, and we look more at the smartphone market in our upcoming segment, Taiwan by Number. Each week we share a facet of Taiwan via a number. So, Andrew, are you ready to guess this number? Yes. Okay, we're talking about the <laughs> smartphone market in Taiwan. Okay. What percentage do you think? Um, iPhone has. Wow, iPhone. What percentage of the market in Taiwan? It's last year. Last year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say 45%. Okay, we'll see <laughs> if you're right. <laughs> okay, but speaking of the iPhone, um, we have an iPhone photographer, an amateur photographer here in Taiwan named Erica Wu, and she won the iPhone Photography Awards. These are global awards, three years in a row. Let's take a look at this report. Erica Wu loves photography, but unlike professional photographers that carry tripods in a single-lens reflex camera, Wu just uses her iPhone. For three years in a row, Wu has won the iPhone Photography Awards. 
In 2016, this photo won the top prize in the category of animals. In 2017, this photo won an honorable mention. Last year, Wu's smiling fox won third place in the animal category. Wu said she didn't take smartphone photography seriously until she won the top award. Wu enjoys traveling and has visited 34 countries where she takes photos of scenery, people, animals, food, and architecture. Wu loves taking photos of the animals the most. She said animals are often scared of large cameras, so it's a lot easier to get close to them with a cell phone. That's how she captures these priceless pictures. Okay, Andrew, I asked you what percentage the iPhone has in the market here. Yes, and I said 45%. Okay, let's see how close or not you are. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Only 25%. Oh, wow. So, I mean, Apple products are quite popular. Actually, Apple's opening their second store. They're getting ready to in Taipei, not mm -hmm. too far from their first store at the Taipei 101. But they only have 25%. Now, I'm going to ask Andrew another question. Oh, more and questions. And you can play along at home if you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you think the top five smartphone brands are here in Taiwan. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, I guess HTC would be on the list because it's a Taiwanese brand. Okay. I'm going to guess um, Samsung definitely has a big chunk. I don't even know if I can name more <laughs> cell phones. <laughs> Wait, I can do this. Come on. Uh, actually, I, I can't because I, I only look at, I only, only buy have... one kind. <laughs> it's all iPhone for Andrew, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look at this chart. Apple. See, Apple's number so. one. Samsung's number two at nineteen percent. Asus. I was gonna say Asus. Yeah, they're number three. And oh. then look at Oppo is uh, a Chinese maker. Oh. Xiaomi and Huawei on the bottom are also Chinese makers. So oh, Huawei wow. only has four percent here in Taiwan. Also, Sony, a Japanese brand, is six percent, and HTC is seven percent. Wow. Wow, Isn't wow, Isn't that interesting? Wow. That's fascinating. So we are kind of loyal to our Taiwan brands. Yes. Um, they're pretty high up there. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So what about in the world? Can you name the top uh, five smartphone brands? This is last year. Okay, last year. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to say Apple. <laughs> <laughs> it's up there. Definitely Samsung. Uh-huh. Definitely Huawei because Xiaomi. I'm going to say two Chinese brands. Um, Nokia. Is Nokia still around? It is, but not way up there. Let's take a look. Okay, oh. Samsung's number one. Apple and Huawei are tied for number two. Xiaomi is number four. Then also Oppo, Vivo, they're all Chinese brands. Oh, LG, okay. LG's in there. And Lenovo, that Nokia's was... Nokia's like um, 1%. Oh, wow. Wow. So, but, you know, because the Chinese smartphone market is gigantic, over a billion users, mm -hmm. so... A lot of them are loyal to Chinese brands. Yeah, absolutely. When you have the largest population in the world. You have an advantage. Yes, you have an advantage. Yeah. So sure. anyways, um, we'll be following the Huawei story. It's very fascinating. Alrighty. Alrighty. But you know, the Dragon Boat Festival is coming up this weekend. So uh, we want to wish you a happy Dragon Boat Festival. But um, it falls on Friday this uh, year, Friday, June 7th. And the races and festivities continue throughout the whole weekend. Now, a little bit later on in our show, I'm going to tell you some fascinating facts and surprising facts about the Dragon Boat Festival. But first, we want to focus in on the star of the show, those massive, ornately carved dragon boats that seat a crew of 22. These days, most of the dragon boats are mass-produced, but there is a master craftsman still here in Yilan, Taiwan. And let's take a look at this report about him. A row of handmade dragon boats lines the river, ready for the races this weekend. They're the handiwork of master craftsman Liu Qingzheng, who's been making them since he was 18. Sixty years later, he still makes them by hand. It's a laborious process, and with no blueprint to work off, Liu has to take special care making sure that the structure of the boat is just right. <laughs> The most important thing is getting the center line in the right place and making sure the boat is balanced. He learned this from the previous generation. 
This was passed down from our ancestors, he says. As far as he knows, he's the fourth generation of boat builders. But maybe it goes back even further. Leo's father made boats that plied the canals, delivering goods. But the family switched to dragon boats due to a change in demand. This boat is about 30 years old, he says, admiring his handiwork. Not only are these boats built to be raced, they're also prized as floating works of art. But like many traditional crafts, there's a concern that no one will pass it on. With Leo's own son opting not to learn the family trade, the Elan City office has decided to shoot a documentary in the hopes of sharing Leo's skills and his passion with generations to come. It's great to watch him making those boats. Um, Absolutely. The sad thing is that perhaps one day most of these boats are going to be mass produced, but it's great there is a documentary being shot preserving his techniques. Now, you may be curious to know why dragon boats get their own festival here in Taiwan. That's the focus of today's Taiwan Explained. In today's Taiwan Explained, I'm going to tell you the origins of the Dragon Boat Festival and how it's celebrated today. Okay, we have one minute here. Are you ready? <laughs> yes, I think so. Go. All right, so the original name of the festival in Chinese is Duan Wu Jie. It's named after the fifth day of the fifth month in the lunar calendar. Now, it's actually a very old holiday uh, that was around long before it had anything to do with dragon boats. Uh, it used to be for warding off bad luck and evil spirits during an unlucky month. Now, the current way we celebrate it can be traced back to this man. His name is Chu Yuan. He was a poet and politician during the Warring States period in China. Now, Chu committed suicide by wading into a river in the year 278 BC. Now, today he's remembered as a loyal and patriotic poet who was betrayed by corrupt officials, and people were very moved by his martyrdom for his country and his principles. And that gave birth to several modern traditions. For example, this. His followers rode out into the river to search for his body, and some say that inspired the modern-day dragon boat races. And legend has it they rude, threw rice dumplings into the river to stop the fish from eating his body, and that inspired this. Andrew! <laughs> <laughs> I had but one word I, left. I, oh, really? Good <laughs> yeah. for you. So they threw the rice dumplings in the river to stop the fish from eating his body, and that's why we eat zongzi. Which awesome. are very delicious, and look at all the different types of zongs out there. Absolutely. And that's today's Taiwan Explained. Up next, we take a look at what's trending on social media on hashtag Taiwan. This week on hashtag Taiwan, one thing that has been trending on social media is attention to the art installation, the Tank Man exhibit commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen incident. Let's take a look at this thread of tweets. Okay, Samson Ellis says, so I decided to cycle over to Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, Liberty Square, after lunch to see if the stories of a giant inflatable tank man exhibit were true. And sure enough, it was there. Now he was curious to see if there were any Chinese tourists that were in the area looking at the exhibit. And he says he saw a few Chinese tourists showing interest. He overheard one say it would be a m more meaningful piece of art if it was a DPP politician <laughs> in front of the tank. And remember that the DPP has traditionally had a pro-independence stance. Now in this next tweet, he says he was just wandering around keeping an eye out for any Chinese tourists when half of the leaders of the 1989 student movement showed up. And one of the leaders, Wang Dan, who is on the left, um, stood up to say something, and this is what he said. This tank is a memory for us, but it's a warning for Taiwan. If China annexes Taiwan, the next Chinese tanks you see on the streets of Taipei won't be inflatable ones. Now, China has been vigilant the past few weeks leading up to June 4th. They have an army of robots censoring any mention of the incident. But here in Taiwan, a lot of activists and scholars have gathered to discuss openly what happened in Tiananmen Square 30 years ago. And that's it for this week's Hashtag Taiwan. Be sure to connect with us on social media. And if you have any story tips, let us know. Finally, we'll leave you with this parting shot. At the beginning of the program, we showed you a picture. So we gave you the hint that it's located in the middle of a running track. Now, you might not know exactly where it is, but do you know what kind of building it is? Can you figure it out? Well, let's take a look at this 
parting shot. So this is Tannan Elementary School located in Nantou County, central Taiwan. It's officially the smallest elementary school in Taiwan. It sits entirely within a running track and houses about 100 students. The school was modeled after the houses of the local Banun people with its library and classrooms occupying sacred spots within the house. There's also an emphasis on connecting with nature as we see in the large open areas that allow students to play sports and hold traditional ceremonies. Look at that. It's totally surrounded by that track. And you know what's amazing about this is the 921 earthquake actually flattened most of the buildings in the area. Mm. And the local people from the Bunun tribe decided that they wanted to rebuild the school before anything else because they thought that the future lied within the children. And I thought that's great. That's true. Yeah, Our absolutely. future lies within the children. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's edition of Taiwan Insider. Be sure to connect with us on social media and leave a comment below. Also, check out the show notes below, and we have more links to things we talked about in the show. We hope to hear from you. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Natalie So, And I'm Andrew Ryan. See you next week.